male Andrina. And uh, this this little bee was out in my yard today. I've got some heather out there that was blooming and um, the, the males were all over it. So this is a great sign that spring is here and we can all rejoice because uh, we've got flying bees in the yard. So if I had found a bumblebee, I would have put that picture up, but we'll just go with this little mining bee for today. Bumblebees are, um, I'm going to cover three things in this uh, talk, basically, or sort of some general background about bumblebees and, and uh, kind of little factoids about them. Uh, we'll talk about those. Uh, we'll give an overview of why bumblebees have declined, uh, at least what we, we think are the reasons. And then we'll talk about this rusty patch bumblebee conservation um, and some efforts that are going on there and things you can do. Uh, this picture down here is not rusty patch bumblebee. This is a, a nest of uh, Bombus huntii or the hunt bumblebee that I raised when I was out in, in Utah. And they're pretty common bee out there. They're also very pretty. So bumblebees worldwide, there are about 250 species of bumblebees. Um, this map is really showing that we think the center of diversity, the historic center of diversity uh, is, is in the, around the Himalayan plateau in Asia. There's the most about 116 species that occur in that region. So that's a lot. They've um, spread across most of the globe uh, and into North America where they've become uh, you know, fairly uh, diverse, 46, 47 species in North America, um, and even moved into South America, uh, where we see some diversity as well. Um, but there's a few spots, you'll notice Africa is kind of missing bumblebees, they don't really have any, uh, nor does Australia. However, uh, a few places like New Zealand has had introductions of bumblebees, uh, the British took them there in the 1800s and they rapidly spread uh, and then also in Tasmania, they've also been introduced. Um, there's been a few accidental introductions through commercial movement into South America and into Japan. Uh, we also have some evidence that, that there's uh, accidental introductions in the Middle East from movement of commercial bumblebees. Uh, and we recently, last year, had our first uh, document documentation of release of uh, non-native bumblebees in North America, uh, uh, up around the Seattle area, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, those are actually bees that are native to the eastern U.S., but were moved for commercial purposes out to the western United States and accidentally escaped. Bumblebees are primitively eusocial. Uh, if you think of honeybees, honeybees are, are what we call uh, highly eusocial in that they have a uh, social system that is, is year-round. So there's always workers and there's always a queen in the colony. Um, when bumblebees go through the winter. They go through the winter as a single queen. Uh, this is a little queen bumblebee here on a flower. Um, they go through the winter as a single queen and they emerge in the spring, usually around this time of year, and, uh, and they'll begin to make a nest. So here's the beginning of a nest. This is a little chunk of pollen and you can see two little round lumps. These are um, developing larvae. The queen has laid eggs on this pollen and she'll incubate them by laying her body across it. You can see here where she's laying her body across the brood lump. Um, and keep them warm and she feeds them more pollen and they grow and eventually workers emerge. Uh, once those workers emerge, they enter what's called the eusocial phase of the colony. So the workers are doing all the tasks like foraging for uh, pollen and nectar, nest cleaning, brood care, and the queen's essentially laying eggs and um, essentially asserting her dominance over the workers so they keep doing their jobs. Um, and uh, later in the summer, uh, the nests will grow and grow, and, and some nests, depending on species, if you look at the common eastern bumblebee or hunt bumblebee, the nests can reach up to about a thousand individuals. Uh, so they'll grow rapidly through the summer uh, until you get a big crowded nest like this with lots of, these are all brood lumps, these sort of light areas here at various stages of development. Uh, and you get a lot of males and workers that are produced toward the end of the summer. They'll fly out, the males will. They'll find um, new virgin queens that are also emerging from the nests. They'll mate, uh, there's the mating. And then the, the males will die, the workers will die off. The nests themselves will begin to um, sort of be abandoned by the bees. Uh, and then the queens, the new queens will find a clump of ground, dig a little hole into it in what we call a hibernacula, and then they will hibernate over the winter by themselves in a solitary phase. 
And in the spring, this time of year, that's all beginning to repeat itself as the queens come back out. So we say they're primitively used social because they have both this solitary and social phase. Um, bumblebees themselves are dietary generalists, meaning that they eat uh, a whole bunch of different kinds of eat, uh, pollen and nectar from a whole bunch of different kinds of flowers. Uh, we do tend to think of them as having, um, we might consider majors and minors. So uh, certain plants that they have strong affinities for uh, and others that they'll go to if it's what's available. Um, and so, and that will also vary by species of bumblebees. So some bumblebees will specialize on on like this little bumblebee here at the top is feeding on white clover. Um, and uh, so they'll go to that and they'll enjoy it, but they may shy away from other things like these tomatoes, which sometimes some bumblebees will go to and others don't seem to be as interested in. Um, uh, on the other hand, you have these long uh, tubular flowers that are in penstemon that some bumblebees, like a large bumblebee with a very long tongue can access the nectar in it. Um, but med medium sized bees can't reach the nectar you will, however, see some small bumblebees try to climb into those flowers and get to it if they can. Bumblebees are also buzz pollinators, meaning that um, when they encounter a flower, they'll actually grip it with their mandibles and they'll vibrate their flight muscles. Uh, this causes a buzzing sound. Uh, it also causes pollen to be released from pores in the anthers. Uh, those, the pollen's then collected on generally the, on the bumblebee's stomach and it collects those and packs it into its um, pollen baskets or it can then transport them back to the hive. And you can see, maybe you can see this, there's a full pollen basket on the bee's leg right here. If you haven't seen pollen baskets before, um, they're just lumps where they, they uh, wet the pollen slightly and clump it together in there. Um, and because of this buzz pollination, bumblebees are highly efficient pollinators uh, and they do very well at uh, re extracting pollen from flowers and transporting it to other flowers. So we think of the value is, of a bumblebee as a pollinator is very high. Um, this is the study we did in 2015 uh, where we co-located uh, bumblebees, this hunt bumblebee, uh, with honeybees, Apis mellifera, uh, in, a, in an area. So we had hives of each uh, in the same spot and we tracked what they were foraging for, the kind of pollen. Um, this is the plant family of pollen. So Fabaceae is the pea family, Solanaceae is the, the tomatoes and uh, peppers and things like that, Asteraceae are asters. Uh, Rosaceae are um, it's the rose family, but that includes things like apples and um, a lot of fruit trees, uh, etc. So we have a. This is just to show that that what we have is um, various diets. Um, bumblebees really like this pea family; they feed on it a lot. This gray shows that a large proportion of their diet is that. At the same date, uh, for honeybees, they were foraging only on a small proportion; less than twenty percent of their diet was from the peas. Um, However, uh, they did like Asteraceae a lot. They're the asters. So honeybees tend to prefer those Asteraceae. They'll eat a bunch of different things. Uh, but what you notice is that there's some overlap. Uh, there's some gray in each and there's some yellow in each, but they're not one-to-one -one competition. So while they do forage on similar things to uh, honeybees, um, they're not exactly foraging for the same thing. I, I sort of equate this to um, the difference between going to Chili's or the difference between going to Denny's. Um, you can get a hamburger at each of them, but uh, if you want a, a pancake at two in the morning, you need to go to Denny's. Um, however, if you want a Baja taco, you probably need to go to Chili's. So these bumblebees and honeybees are really, they have a lot of overlap in what they eat, but it's not one-to-one. -one. Uh, bumblebees have a pretty high value as crop pollinators. Um, in 2012, uh, we estimated that um, bumblebees were pollinating about $609 million worth of tomatoes in greenhouses every year. Um, we don't have good estimates on, on any uh, recent estimates on that. Uh, although tomato greenhouse production is, has exploded over the last decade, so this is probably much higher at this point. Uh, likewise, bumblebees are now used uh, pretty extensively for blueberries, cranberries, pumpkins, watermelon, a uh, number of other crops as well, where uh, especially if that crop is grown under plastic or in, uh, in a greenhouse. Uh, they're very efficient in greenhouse settings as pollinators. And of course, they have an enormous value to wildland pollination. Uh, probably can't quantify uh, that in a, in a dollar amount, but they're very important for um, pollinating wildland flowers throughout the United States or throughout North America. 
So uh, bumblebees are important. And uh, one thing that we've sort of talked about is that bumblebees are declining. And we might be wondering how rusty patch bumblebee got to the point of being an endangered species. Uh, so I want to walk through a quick timeline on how that happened and uh, and talk about sort of how we first began noticing declines and then some details on, on uh, what we, some detailed studies on that. So in 1987, bumblebees, uh, first began to be commercially raised in Europe. Um, it's a relatively new uh, adventure, really. There were some documents, uh, some studies of people in the early 1900s, late 1800s, actually catching bumblebee queens and raising colonies from them, but they didn't commercialize it. and They didn't do it uh, really for pollination, more just to sort of have the bees and, and look at them. So it wasn't until the late um, 1980s that we actually had commercial, commercial production, and that pretty quickly spread across the globe so that um, by 1991, we had commercial rearing taking place in North America. Uh, and, and most of this was aimed at tomato pollination. Um, tomatoes, honeybees won't generally visit tomatoes and a lot of them are grown in greenhouses. Uh, and honeybees don't generally like to uh, fly in greenhouses. They, they will fly up to the ceiling and kind of bang their head on the glass trying to get out. Uh, bumblebees tend to be pretty content if you have the uh, colony in a greenhouse at just going from flower to flower and doing their job. Um, so this was, uh, people in Europe were, were having to hand pollinate tomatoes in greenhouses, which you can imagine was fairly expensive to hire people to go around and, and use a, 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 essentially a, an electric toothbrush to buzz each flower with. Um, it's much easier and more efficient to use honey or uh, bumblebees. And so that's how this industry began. Uh, in about 1992, so 91, the US, in the US and Canada, we began raising uh, commercial bumblebees, but it was a slow process and there were a lot of um, techniques to be worked out that they had already figured out in Europe. So um, under a permit issued by USDA APHIS, some bumblebee queens were shipped to Europe. Uh, they raised a bunch of colonies with them, worked out some of the methodology, and then shipped those queens back. Uh, and uh, that was seemed to be fine. They did that for a few years. And then uh, within a couple years, by 1998, we began seeing disease, uh, a, a specific disease called Nosema bombay, uh, arising in uh, rearing facilities that got progressively worse. Uh, and that, and it got progressively worse such that uh, the companies that were raising the bumblebees quit raising one species of them because it was so diseased. Uh, and they switched to a different species in the United States and in Canada. Um, around that same time in 98 and through about 2001, uh, this gentleman, Dr. Robin Thorpe, who is at UC Davis, um, was doing a lot of bee surveys out in wildlands in California and Oregon. And he began to notice that the uh, that certain species of bumblebees were becoming much more rare. And it happened very quickly. So he was doing these surveys in the late 90s but by 2001, two of the species in particular became um, really uncommon. So we'd only see one or two of them every year in his surveys where he was seeing uh, up to 100 of each in previous years. Uh, so he began to raise the alarm that there might be something going on with bumblebees. Uh, by 2008, there were some studies, uh, one specifically looking at rusty patch bumblebee out of uh, done by Sheila Cola, who's at University of Toronto. Uh, and she showed that uh, rusty patch bumblebee and a number of other bumblebee species were becoming more rare in the eastern U.S. and Canada. And uh, around this time, I was involved with Sydney Cameron at University of Illinois. Uh, I was out in Utah, but we, were, we started a, our, the first U.S. nationwide survey to assess bumblebee declines in 2007. And um, we published that work in 2011, showing the decline of several bumblebee species uh, nationwide. So it wasn't just restricted to local areas and it couldn't be attributed to things like, you know, local habitat degradation. We knew there must be bigger problems going on. Uh, along with that study, we also actually looked at pathogen levels and the levels of this Nosema bombay in wild populations. And we showed a pretty strong correlation between declining species and the prevalence of this pathogen. So it seemed that Nosema was really playing a part. Uh, in 2013, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation petitioned the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to list rusty patch bumblebee as an endangered species. Uh, they submitted several other petitions for other bumblebees as well, and those all kind of sat around for a few years, uh, and then through various litigation and fighting, um, finally the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, proposed to list rusty patch bumblebee uh, 
in 2016. Anyone who thinks that uh, getting a species listed on the endangered species under the Endangered Species Act, species Act is easy, uh, I can assure you, is mistaken. It took a lot of work and and many people a lot of time uh, to build a really strong case that this was actually happening and uh, and we needed to protect it. In 2017, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came up with what they call their final decision to list the species. Uh, I think it's then it gets advertised in the Federal Register. It's open for public comment, uh, and and then um, it gets sort of an up or down vote by uh, uh, the executive branch to uh, list it or not. So um, in 2018, or rather in 2017, this actually uh, finally came through with this final decision to list this species. So. Um, it was a long way and it took a lot of accumulation of, of data and, and information to get to that point. Uh, and then since then, there's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has more or less taken over um, the lead in, in efforts to recover populations and to delist the rusty patch bumblebee. So the goal of any um, listing of, a, a, of an organism under the Endangered Species Act is to recover the populations and get it off of the endangered species list. Uh, that's the first thing they tell you when you go to a meeting uh, of uh, uh, the Endangered Species Act uh, is, is involved in is uh, our goal here is to get this thing off the, the endangered species list. So uh, we've been working uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for the last three or four years to really do this. Um, there were a lot of, uh, as I said, there were a lot of studies that were being done on declines of bumblebees and, uh, and various studies have come out to show that, that uh, various, there are various problems with how they're declining, the rate at which they're declining, it seems to be global. Um, and then there's also a lot of studies that are looking at reasons why um, bumblebees might be declining. Was it, is that climate? Is it pathogens? Uh, in this case, are they just too fat to mate? Um, uh, that's, that's not the real reason. Um, they're not actually too fat to mate. Uh, that's just a bad headline. Thank you, Atlantic. Um, so why are bumblebees declining? What's causing this? Well, there are multiple interactions and multiple stressors that we know are affecting all kinds of different bees. These aren't all just bumblebees here in the middle. They're, um, all sorts of different bees. But the, uh, important thing is to know that, that all of these bees are being impacted by pathogens and diseases, by pesticides, by habitat loss, uh, intensive farming, fragmentation, uh, and of course, uh, climate issues that are also causing um, not only host, their host plants to, to change, but also uh, the temperatures in which these bees inhabit. And of course, all those things interact as well. There have been a number of studies that have suggested that the climate is uh, is causing bee declines. Um, this paper by Warwick or not Warwick Kerr, uh, Jeremy Kerr at uh, University of Toronto has shown that um, the uh, that it, that certain populations of bumblebees are disappearing in the southern ends of their ranges or becoming much less common there. And it also appears um, in the study by uh, Graham Pike down in Colorado that bees uh, bumblebees have moved upslope so they are inhabiting higher and higher meadows um, every year as new habitat opens up for them at the high range but the lower range the habitat dries out earlier in the season and so they can't inhabit some of those areas um, early in the season or rather late in the season um, there's of course habitat loss land use has impacted bee distributions and this has been shown in europe it's also been shown in the United States on, on more local scales where, uh, where areas get modified through either farming or uh, urbanization and that removes habitat for the bees. Uh, pesticides have also been implicated. Uh, Scott McArt at Cornell University did a study and he showed that uh, the range contractions that we documented in our um, 2011 study with Sydney Cameron are, are tightly uh, correlated with uh, changes in fungicide use, uh, especially this chlorothalonil, uh, which is a widely used fungicide. Uh, and you might think, wow, fungicides, why would bumblebees care about fungicides? They're not fungus. Uh, we think that actually these fungicides are important um, and that they impact the diet of the bee when they get sprayed onto the flowers uh, and the bees then go forage. They're also eating these uh, fairly toxic fungicides. 
even though they're formulated to kill fungus, they're not particularly good for either uh, you or me or bees. Uh, and then of course there are pathogens. And I'm gonna talk a bit about pathogens because a lot of the work I do uh, revolves around bees and things, uh, pathogens that make them sick, which I guess um, these days is, is maybe uh, topical. Um, there's a pathogen spillover hypothesis uh, that was first put out for bumblebees by Sheila Cole and Michael Otterstatter, uh, two Canadians, um, in two papers that they put out together um, that seemed to show that pathogens of bumblebees were higher adjacent to uh, areas where they're commercially used, so greenhouses. And uh, what they did was they, they went out and they surveyed around greenhouses and they looked in greenhouses where they were um, having commercial bumblebees. And what they saw was that, that those sites had higher bee densities, but they also had higher pathogen densities around them. Um, this seemed to indicate that maybe the commercial bees were coming in with pathogens and um, spreading them out into wild populations. Uh, Nils Cordes uh, led this one paper that I was on in, in 2011 where we looked at declining uh, species of bees in the U.S. and we noticed that they had higher Nosema bombi levels than stable bee species as well. Uh, and then this work done by FIRST uh, and, and a group of people over in uh, England showed that where honeybees were present, bumblebees have higher rates of deformed wing virus and Nosema sarani levels, showing that, that perhaps bumblebees are actually also being impacted by honeybee pathogens and not just other bumblebee pathogens. Um, this, this last paper came out during a sort of a flurry of papers that were coming out around that time that people were really studying the impacts of, of pathogen movement throughout bees, uh, not just within in a single species, but across species. And what we really began to see is that um, things, especially these viruses, um, deformed wing virus, black queen cell virus, uh, Israeli acute paralysis virus that we thought were honeybee specific viruses turn out to be very common in a lot of um, other bee species, and in fact, a lot of other insect species. So um, when you think that uh, coronavirus can only, um, you think it's surprising that it jumps from bats to, to humans, well, um, it's not surprising to those of us who study bees and see it jumping equally far, uh, in, in the, at least in the evolutionary sense, from um, flies to bees and, and beetles. So. So in 2015 and 2019, my lab ran some uh, national bee surveys. Uh, the first in 2015 was really focused on understanding pathogens and their distribu distributions across landscapes. And then 2019, we just went back to look at those sites that we looked at in 2015 to see if, um, if the bee communities had changed at those sites and what that might mean. Uh, really, we're, we're interested in monitoring uh, the health of bumblebee communities because there can be multiple species at a site and making sure that the species that were there um, in 2015 are still there now. Uh, our 2015 sampling, each of the black dots on this map shows the spot we went to. Uh, we collected about 3,600 bumblebees, um, 100 per site. We got 31 of the 38 species that occur in the United States. Um, and we surveyed in 18 total sites. So we did also a, a variety of landscape types. We did some commercial areas that were used as farm fields and there were greenhouses actually where this big dot in the center is, was a greenhouse. And then we put a, a one kilometer um, buffer around the, that farm property and we surveyed within that. And then we had these wild sites that we also surveyed that were near those commercial sites, but, but were separated by at least 25 kilometers. It's about um, just over 10 miles. Uh, and uh, just, just to get a sort of wild community uh, understanding of what was going on as well. So we took the bees, we brought them back into the lab. We, we actually killed them and froze them. And uh, sorry, science here. Um, we cut them open uh, when we got back to the lab. We pulled out their guts and then we, we did two things with it. Some of them went into a DNA extraction process. Uh, so we extracted RNA and DNA. Uh, and then we use this is called a thermocycler and this allows you to do PCR. So this is, um, yeah, here's a, another topical little science lesson. So this is what they're doing when they're doing um, coronavirus tests. They're taking RNA because it's an RNA virus and a lot of bees have RNA viruses. Um, and they're taking that and what they do is they run it through a process that they they amplify it. So they take one strand of that RNA that they got out of your nose 
um, and then they add in primers and other reagents and they run it through this thermocycling process which heats and cools it and that causes that those strands of RNA to copy themselves. So you get many, many, many copies. Once you get a lot of copies, you can run them on a gel. This is a, oh, let's see if I get my cursor in the right spot over here. I lost it somehow. Down in the bottom right here, this is a gel made of agarose. And you, you put the little sample in, there's a little well here. You put that little bit of RNA that you've amplified in here and you run an electrical current through it and it causes this, um, that fragment of RNA because the RNA is electrically charged to move through this. Uh, and then what we do is we stain it with a little stain and you can see how big it is. So this over here on the left is a ladder. So these are known sizes of DNA or RNA. Um, this, goes, this ladder goes from, um, this is probably 50 base pairs long um, all the way up to about 500 base pairs long. Uh, and based on how long these fragments run through, we can tell uh, what kind of pathogen was in there because we, they're of known lengths. So we design our primers so that we get known lengths when we do this. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into designing this. This actually took us about a year to develop um, these ones in bumblebees. So when everybody's like, why don't we have tests faster for um, coronavirus? I was like, <laughs> I know. Um, they also have a lot more people working on it. So that's why they were able to get these tests improved very quickly and now they're very fast. Um, but it still takes time. You have to get the RNA. This takes about a couple hours to do this um, extraction and amplification. And then you've got to either run it on a gel or in some cases they now have um, more electrical ways to do this where they, you can run it through a sequencer and get a, a result very quickly. But that's what they're doing when they do these tests um, for you. And that's what we did for the bees. Um, then uh, we, we would also take things out. So sometimes when you cut a bee open, you notice that there's something inside of it. This, if you look closely, looks kind of like a fly grub, and that's what it is. This is from a canopid fly. It's a, um, one of the parasites, it's a fly parasite that attacks bumblebees uh, and lays its egg on the back of the bee. The larvae hatches out, crawls in through the uh, bee's cuticle, um, and then uh, begins developing in it. And so this larvae is one that we pulled out um, of the bee, we identify it under the microscope. Um, and we look also at the same time at the gut contents to see if we can find spores. These are Nosema spores down here. Um, sometimes we find those at about 400 X magnification. Uh, and then everything else got frozen. So the rest of the bees were frozen. So we go back and, and sort of look again if we found some interesting things. So we did all, all this, we did these molecular tests, we did these dissection tests for these big flies and things. And then we did these, um, high-powered microscopy to, to find uh, spores. So, sorry, that was a lot of information. I felt like you might be interested in the, the, the testing though. Um, so, uh, under the dissections, we found a lot of things. This is one of those canopid flies that I told you attacks the bees and lays the egg on the back. They're very, I think they're really beautiful. Um, I actually really like parasites, which is part of why I do what I do. Um, and this is a little forward fly down here. It's another one that will parasitize bees. This is one that's responsible for, um, you may have heard of the story of the zombies, honeybees that were parasitized by flies that would then go to the lights at night um, around people's houses. So if you are out in your backyard at night in the summer and you see honeybees that are buzzing around your lights, they shouldn't be out, but they're often ones that are parasitized with these forward flies. They're not very common, um, but it does happen and sometimes you notice it. So if you actually catch those bees, and keep them alive in a jar for a little bit, they'll eventually die and these flies will emerge out of them because they're growing in them. Um, there are mites uh, on bees, both on the outside of bees and on the inside of bees. These are um, bumblebee tracheal mites, which are not the same as honeybee tracheal mites, but they actually live in the um, abdominal air sacs of the bumblebees. Uh, and they can get to levels where they will kill the bees if they get too prevalent. Uh, there are nematodes that attack the bees, so they'll go inside of them. Again, they grow in the abdomen of the bees. Uh, this is one nematode, uh, which is a queen castrating nematode. In other words, it attacks queen bumblebees. Uh, when it gets into them, it, force, it, it, it sort of takes over their central nervous system. And instead of them going out and starting a new nest in the wild, they will fly around to flowers uh, and feed and feed and feed as, this, as these nematodes grow inside of them they'll feed and then of course the nematode's benefiting because it's getting a free lunch. Um, but then instead of starting a nest, the bumblebee will fly back to its hibernacula, to that wintering site. It'll crawl into the ground and die. 
and these nematodes will then erupt out of the bee. Uh, and they'll, they'll then fill up that whole um, nesting area, that wintering area that the queens use. So when other queens come back in the fall, they then get parasitized by these nematodes. Again, these are fairly rare, but they do occur and it's kind of a, a, a pretty fascinating biology that they're able to take over the bee's central nervous system and uh, have it do things it wouldn't normally do. Uh, there's also these microparasites. These are things we think of as more classic diseases, protozoans and fungal diseases. Um, these trypanosomatids, uh, neogregorines, and microsporidia. Microsporidia are the nosema. These are ones you um, may, if you know, if you have honeybees, you've probably heard of nosema um, apis and nosema serrani. Bumblebees get nosema serrani. They also get this nosema bombi, which is bumblebee specific. Uh, there are viruses, black queen cell virus. If you've been watching the news, you've probably seen pictures that look sort of like these. Um, RNA viruses, uh, they, they're these kind of round balls with little things on the outside of them. And they, they, these are your, uh, the little bumps you see are where it re, uh, they match up with cell receptors on the animal cell. And that's how they actually um, connect to the cell and then invade the cell through these, uh, the bumps on the outside here. Um, so bumblebees get a number of uh, diseases or, or viruses that we think of as, as sort of classic honeybee, uh, diseases, black queen cell virus, the form wing virus, Israeli acute paralysis virus, cashmere bee virus, and sac brood virus are all ones that are fairly common. Um, what was interesting after this study, this is just 900 of the specimens. I don't have the, the I, I haven't updated this since we finished the study. Um, but even early on, we saw that about 80 um, of workers, about 80% of the workers had some kind of parasite, whether it was a virus, a fungus, uh, a, a fly, um, they just, or, or, or even mites on the outside, um, they, they had a lot of associations with other organisms. It's not particularly surprising um, in that we also have a lot of associations with us. If you know, you do, you know, if you uh, go on antibiotics, you're, you, you're, it can hurt your guts, right? Because you're killing off all the things that live inside of you. Some of those are good and some are bad. Um, so bumblebee workers tend to be pretty highly infected. Queens less so, um, just over, just under 50% um, have, have something in them. Um, and male bumblebees also have fairly low uh, parasitism levels. This is probably because workers spend a lot of time out in the environment on flowers foraging and they're running into a lot of stuff in the environment that can make them sick. Um, and so the more time you spend outside, the more likely you are to catch something, or I should say out of the hive. And, and again, this is a, going back to social distancing, uh, bumblebees are going to flowers, right? They're flying in and they're going on flowers and other bumblebees come onto those same flowers and touch the same spot. And we know that we can transmit these viruses on flowers from bee to bee. Um, so this is the same idea. These queens are, are not going out to those flowers nearly as much. So their chances of catching something new are pretty low. Um, and so most of what we're seeing in queens for diseases they have are probably diseases they wintered with and came out of and then are gonna pass on to their daughters. The, uh, the things we see that are the most common were really these microparasites, the nosema, the apocystis, the, the protozoan and fungal diseases were pretty common. Um, about 20% of individual bees had uh, nosema or, or one of these other things. Uh, black queen cell virus um, is very common. Almost 30% of all bees that we surveyed had this. Um, what's interesting about this is we have no idea what it does in bumblebees. Uh, we, we don't know any of the pathology associated with it. If there even is any, they might just be carriers um, that are out in the environment. We sort of equate it to the, the bumblebees cold sore. It's something you probably don't want to get, but it's, it's not going to kill you if you do. Um, but we don't really know. There may actually be pathologies that are associated with this um, that we just haven't figured out yet. But it's certainly one that we we uh, are interested in just because it's so common. Um, these other ones, uh, deformed wing virus is fairly uncommon. Other studies have shown this to be about 20% in some populations. We found a few populations where it approached 10%, but generally we thought it was a fairly uncommon disease. Um, Israeli acute paralysis virus, again, we don't know what this does in bumblebees, um, and it only seems to be in about 5% of them. Uh, and then sac brood virus, again, no known pathology in bumblebees, but fairly common, almost 20%. 
Uh, Nosema, again, we found in this study that it was uh, very highly distributed in declining groups of bees. So uh, some of you said your favorite bumblebee was the uh, um, uh, Bombus pensavanicus, the American bumblebee. That's uh, this one right here. Um, and that group of bumblebees tends to have really high Nosema rates, about, uh, um, about 30%. We saw it in really high associations with things like, um, well, we didn't have Bombus aphanus, but related species like uh, the Western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis, or um, uh, Bombus tricola, the uh, yellow-banded bumblebee, also had very high um, levels of Nosema, and those were all declining species. So in 2019, we repeated some sampling. Uh, we tried to fill in some of the gaps, places that we had not sampled so much before. Um, so those are those or the those small orange um, triangles there were new sites that we did in 2019 and we revisited some of these but not all the black spots that we went to in 2015 um, and we didn't do a big pathogen uh, study on that this year because it was um, it was uh, too much work to do to repeat it all it took us about four years to finish that 2015 sampling which is why we didn't get back to resample in 2019. So. Rusty patch bumblebee, um, the sort of historic range of the bumblebee is this shaded area here, uh, the lighter green area. Um, and then where you see blue dots, those are spots where the rusty patch bumblebee have been seen um, uh, since about 2000. And uh, then the, these yellow and red dots are areas with more recent uh, sightings. So ones that have been reported to Fish and Wildlife Service since 2007. Um, but what's really interesting, um, if you overlay uh, a map with this, you can see that a lot of these sightings of, of rusty patch bumblebee that are recent, this is Minneapolis, uh, this is Madison, Wisconsin, here's Chicago and Milwaukee, uh, and then Indianapolis. Uh, and then there's another population that we sort of know, and this was mostly from the last two years, these sightings down here in West Virginia and on the Virginia border. Um, but what's really interesting that, that when we look at this is that a lot of the populations that are still remaining um, are, are really around urban and suburban areas and people are finding them a lot in their, um, in their backyards, in urban gardens and things like that. Now you might think, well, you know, maybe people are just looking for them here and they're not looking for them in any of these Northeastern states. And what's interesting um, in, in Ohio, uh, is that uh, a lot of these states, uh, Michigan as well, have done um, a lot of extensive surveying on the state level. Uh, you know, the Ohio Bee Atlas uh, study was looking for rusty patch bumblebee. Um, Maine just finished a bee atlas last year. I think Vermont just uh, did one. So there have been several states here that have been looking for these bees and have been unable to find them. So it's not really due to a, a lack of effort in trying to find them so much as we think they're just missing. But we were really excited to find that, that this West Virginia population exists because uh, that was one we had thought they were gone from this area until about a year ago and then people started finding them there. So where are people finding them in landscapes? Well, most of the recent findings have been in uh, either public botanical gardens, community garden plots, uh, universities uh, around, uh, I have a, a colleague who works at University of um, Minnesota and she's got them out in her, um, her little bee garden right outside of their bee lab there. They've got rusty patch bumblebee, which is pretty exciting. Um, a lot of people have been finding them in private gardens in their yard um, and then public rights of way. They tend to be uh, areas along highways and things like that where they're planting um, uh, pollinator strips. They're getting rusty patch bumblebee in those uh, up in Minnesota and in Madison. So, so there are um, some areas up there that seem to really be responding to habitat restoration. But what we don't really know is why cities, cities and suburban areas are sort of functioning as the refuge for these bees versus wildlands um, or, or farms even. Um, one thing that's going on, it's been a project that's been going on, this has really funneled a lot of those yellow dots you saw on that previous map um, a lot of those were generated actually by community science projects like uh, Bumblebee Watch, which is run by the Xerxes Society. Um, and you can go to their site, I think it's just, uh, well, you can go to xerxes.org. Um, and um, if you go there, you can, there's a, at the top of their webpage, it'll be a, a little box that says um, volunteer, and you can click on that, and it'll take you to Bumblebee Watch as one of the possibilities. And you can get this app for your phone if you want, go to the Bumblebee Watch app, 
Um, or you can record things on the computer simply if you take a picture um, and then you can upload them. And I'm gonna walk you quickly through how to submit a sighting. Um, and I would encourage all of you to get on this. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about the Ohio, the Atlas and the and iNaturalist in a minute too. But uh, so Bumblebee Watch has been responsible for all these dots you see here. These are each bee sightings. In some cases, um, a dot will represent, represent multiple bees that were all seen by the same person at the same site. And so they uploaded a lot of information for these spots. Um, and so you can see this a uh, lot, of, lot of information in the Northwest. Xerxes is based out of Portland, Oregon. So they started there and they've got a lot of, of data there. But they also have a lot um, in this Rusty Patch Bumblebee area um, because a lot of focus has been on that. Uh, this was just the Rusty Patch Bumblebee sightings for 2019 that were submitted by um, community scientists um, like yourselves that were interested in helping. Um, and so Minneapolis, obviously a lot, they have pretty healthy populations and they've got a lot of people out looking, so they see a lot of them. Um, around Madison, quite a few, uh, Milwaukee, and then north of Chicago, um, quite a few. But this is um, a limited area. We're not seeing a ton outside of that. And there are definitely, you can see there's a lot of dots up here, uh, but we're not seeing um, rusty patch pop up through these uh, community science efforts in those areas. So. The more people we have looking, the better. Uh, and then folks like me and Rich Hatfield at Xerxes will go on and we, we help do the identifications. Um, so you can help, uh, you can upload a photo, go out, take a picture with your, um, your phone or, or a camera and you can drop the photo right here. Uh, once you pull up the Bumblebee Watch site, there's three steps, record, identify and submit. Um, you drop it here, you fill in the information as you scroll down, it'll ask you where you are. Um, you enter that location and you could do it as a, an address or uh, I think you can even pick a spot on the map and click on it um, or you can use a GPS and enter the latitude and longitude. Oops, too far. Um, then you're going to add some information about this. Uh, they ask what flower the, the bee is visiting. If you know that, you can enter that. Um, any comments you'd like to enter and then you have to give permission for the photo so that, that it'll be shared with us and we can identify it. Um, and then you click next and you go to the um, ID page um, and there will be guides there to help you with identification of the bees. Um, and so here's just the rusty patch uh, description here uh, with a couple little pictures to help you identify it. Um, once you get that in, you can submit your observation and then um, it gets verified by, like I said, one of the uh, experts that go to these sites and, and check on them. So we've got a little team of people that pop in and identify bees when we're bored. Um, the um, Ohio Bee Atlas, of course, was, was run, um, I think Denise would probably correct me, but I think uh, 2016 or 2017 it started. Um, and using uh, this platform called iNaturalist, you could get uh, onto, it's a similar thing where you take your, uh, you get an app on your phone, you go out, you can take a picture of a bee. Um, and you can give it a preliminary identification. Uh, and that marks, the nice thing about iNaturalist is when you take the picture, it marks the site you're at. If you're using the uh, Bumblebee Watch app, it will also automatically mark the site you're at uh, so that you don't have to enter that data later. Um, but you can enter that. And um, so, th but this is being launched now. Melissa Spring, Karen Goodell, and Denise are part of this project to, to um, expand on previous work done by the Bumblebee at or the Bee Atlas. And um, there'll be, you know, if you, some of you I know are already involved in the project to put out pan traps and to sample bees. Uh, and then, um, you know, hopefully in the fall, we'll all be together at pinning parties and not virtual pinning parties to process those samples and help with the identifications. Um, so uh, that project is going on and, and uh, I, I don't, won't comment too much on the status of it because I'm only peripherally involved. So, uh, um, but Denise can talk about that, I'm sure, if you're interested. Um, a current project I have, I mentioned uh, uh, Wisconsin and Madison being a, a main spot for Rusty Patch Bumblebees. So I have this ongoing project with Claudio Gratton, who's at University of Wisconsin. And um, we're looking at to try to understand the impacts of these urban landscapes on uh, bees and on Rusty Patch Bumblebee by looking at um, a, a bunch of different things. You might think that like, you know, the suburbs are not great spots for bees, but it turns out a lot of people have gardens and they've got flowers that they planted. And um, 
we're really interested in, in how those things augment uh, an environment so and how many um, bumblebee colonies can be supported in, in neighborhoods and not just out in rural areas. Um, so we're looking across this urban to rural gradient, um, starting in the city and moving out to farmlands uh, in Wisconsin to, to sample. And we're actually going to um, run a transect, hopefully, uh, if we can launch the project here this summer, we'll be doing that in Columbus as well to look at uh, how bumblebee populations respond across these, both in the number of colonies and the pathogen levels they have, the impacts of pesticides on those, and whether there's other factors that may contribute to bee health along these gradients as well. Um, and so year two in Madison, hopefully this year is year one in Columbus, um, and uh, moving out from city centers out into these nice agricultural fields. This is one of Claudio's students last year out in the field, uh, an abandoned um, field uh, collecting bees. Uh, of course, there are a lot of resources online. You can, um, uh, Ohio State has many things you can get in and probably a lot of you have already uh, waded through these and seen them. Uh, various bee identification guides, attracting pollinators from garden. This is all Denise's stuff um, and, and Mary Gardner and company have put some stuff out as well. Um, this is a US Fish and Wildlife Service if you're interested in Rusty Patch Bumblebee and things going on there. They have a pretty nice website. You can mess around with those maps. I showed those maps with the yellow and red dots. Those come from these guys. Um, and uh, you can go through and look at all those uh, and, and read more about Rusty Patch Bumblebee and some of the efforts to um, help preserve it. Um, and of course, there's a, a website that I'm sure Denise can share later, or she can even share these slides, I think, um, that you can go to if you would like more information. Uh, there's a bunch of people to thank. Um, this was my uh, old lab out in Utah. Uh, most of them are um, have gotten their degrees and moved on, but a couple of them are still there finishing up. So uh, I'm going to end this, stop sharing my screen and show. Stop share. Great, thanks, Jamie. We see your email. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was just reading your email. Oh, yeah. um, while, <laughs> while you were talking about your bumblebee survey, uh, Rob wondered, um, noticed that you didn't sample in Ohio and wondered about that. Uh, yeah, mostly because I wasn't here yet. Um, and uh, yeah, we tried to, you know, we, we tried to focus on spots that we like a lot of the places we went to were places where we knew there were current efforts going on to survey and um, or that we were involved in the survey parts. I wasn't involved in the Ohio um, bee survey, but I knew that there was an Atlas project going on. So there were folks here surveying. It wasn't a lot, a huge need for us to do it. Um, that's, I guess, the answer to that one. I can read these other questions, I guess. Um, yeah, there's another question about behavioral distance differences with rusty patch that could explain some of the um, susceptibilities to pathogens. Yeah, um, I don't know of any behavioral differences that um, would be critical. There's one thing that we think might be important, and, and that is that the species that seem to be susceptible to this pathogen um, all tend to have very long colony cycles. So they come out early in the season uh, and the colonies build up slowly um, and then they last late into the fall. There's a little bit of an exception in that um, some of these like the uh, American bumblebee um, or the fervid bumblebee, they tend to em emerge a little later as queens, but they do uh, tend to have later colony cycles into the fall. So there may be something with this colony cycle length that is important. Um, we don't really know, though. It might just be genetically susceptible. Uh, the next question is, what do you think about efforts to increase bee numbers by raising bees such as blue orchard mason bees? Um, I, I think that's great. I think any, pretty much any effort to raise uh, bees native to your area is, is a good one. Um, so you could do it through raising um, uh, mason bees. Uh, it's definitely one way to do it. Um, you can also uh, improve habitat for other native bees, such as leaving bare ground for ground nesters, like those andrina that I showed you the picture of at the beginning. 
Um, those are ground nesting bees uh, called mining bees is the common name of that group. Um, and so leaving some bare ground and gardens is a good way to do that. You can um, set out bee hotels of various sizes uh, and encourage uh, bees to, to nest in there. And then of course, you know, sort of planting both native plants, but um, you know, non-native plants that provide good pollen and nectar sources is a good way to encourage those as well. So, um, but yeah, I think, you know, uh, I, I would say raising native bees, whether it's blue orchard bees or um, any of the other uh, species is always kind of fun and fascinating to watch the different behaviors as they do their thing. Ah, Tim says, we started the bee atlas in 2017. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would Ohio ever consider reintroductions of Bombus affinis? This is a great question. I was just at a meeting in February um, with Fish and Wildlife Service where we were talking about this very thing, um, not specifically Ohio, but around the range of the species. Uh, and so, and could we raise Bombus affinis in captivity and then bring it to places where it's been removed or lost and, and reintroduce it. Um, I don't know whether Ohio specifically is interested in that. I know um, when I was down at Cincinnati Zoo a couple weeks ago and um, that, that they're very interested in the idea that maybe they could be part of that effort to help raise bumblebees and then release them. Um, I'm guessing that other uh, zoos would be really uh, into that idea, um, I, I think it would be neat. I don't, you know, I like raising bees and I like releasing them. So um, at least native ones. So that, I mean, that's kind of my um, my take on it. I think it'd be a, a, a cool idea. And it's something we've, we're definitely in the early talks about how that might work and what it might look like ultimately. So we're actually trying to write a report on the feasibility of those things now. Are there other questions? Uh, there was one about uh, asking if there are other species of bumblebees that you're concerned about from a population decline perspective. Yeah, well, most of my work um, up till about two years ago, a lot of the work I was doing was on western bumblebee, which is a close relative to uh, rusty patch. And um, it's also one that's been a pretty precipitous decline. Uh, and then also yellow banded bumblebee um, is another one which is, is thought to be in, in trouble. So those are the three sort of big ones. There's a couple other species that are around that we are concerned about, not as concerned. So American bumblebee is definitely one that in some places seems to be becoming less common. Um, and uh, then there's also the cuckoo bumblebees, which parasitize these other bumblebees that as their hosts become rare, they disappear too. Um, and so as someone who has already professed my love for parasites, I'll just say that, um, the, uh, that's another one that concerns me, that we lose the hosts, we lose the parasites. Um, and, uh, you know, they're part of the ecosystem, so I think they're important. Jamie, this week in our class, I posted a story about Robin Thorpe and the work that he had done um, for so many years looking for Franklin's bumblebee. And somebody asked the question if there's anyone picking up um, that, that survey work. Yeah, so Robin's, um, you know, Robin passed away this time last year, actually, I think in May or June. Um, so that was, uh, was a big loss because he had done so much of this uh, early conservation work and um, and really a lot of mentoring for people like me, um, just that they're actually now doing a lot of bumblebee conservation work. We we learned it from him. Um, so it was it was a big thing to, to lose him. He uh, Right now, the sites that he's, I would go out with him, you know, probably starting in about 2007 or eight, I went out to a bunch of his sites with him and surveyed with him. Um, and then my crew, the folks that are still in Utah are going to pick that up now um, and go to those sites. Uh, and then there's also surveying going on um, through Fish and Wildlife Service. They have some ongoing surveys at some of the sites as well. So a couple of the sites are actually really well studied at this point. There's two or three groups that go out every summer and, and revisit those sites and look for Franklin's and, uh, and um, Western Bumblebee at those sites. Um, there's another question about uh, asking, are there bumblebees that are not in dangerous decline? 
Yes. So you will see very shortly, if you haven't already, um, the emergence of bumblebee queens, um, common eastern bumblebee and uh, Bombus bimaculatus. Uh, I don't know the common name for that one. Two spotted maybe. Two -spotted. Um, yeah. Those ones will be, uh, they'll be out and about very soon if they're not already. Um, and you will see them. They're very, both pretty common species. Uh, the brown belted bumblebees, another common species that we see a lot of. Um, so yeah, there are several species that are doing really well. Um, and and I'll say that there are um, a couple of these, like the Western bumblebee and the yellow banded bumblebee that we have been studying for you know, you know a couple decades now. Um, and we're beginning to see that some populations of them at least seem to be rebounding. So while there's, uh, there are declines, there's also some hope out there for some of the species that um, they do have good years and we're like, oh, there were a lot of them this year. And, uh, um, and in some locations, they seem to be really common. So there's some species that are really healthy all over their range and we're not at all concerned about. Um, there are others that, uh, that sort of come and go and we pay attention to them because we're not sure exactly what their um, population cycles are like and other ones that we, we really pay attention to because we know there's problems with, so. But, well, thanks, Jamie. I really appreciate oh. your input today, your time spent with us. Folks, if you want to type in a, um, a thank you or note to Jamie, I'm sure he'd appreciate it. Um, just a quick heads up, we have a, a nice schedule coming together. We have Heather Holm coming for next week's uh, webinar, and then we have Doug Tallamy. We'll have um, Lisa Spring talking about that um, bee bowl survey. And uh, we have Olivia Carroll and just added yesterday, uh, Sam Drebby. So we have an awesome schedule. So since we're inside, we may as well uh, be learning together. So thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks again, Jamie. Really appreciate your um, expertise. And um, thanks everybody. We'll see you soon. All right, thank thanks, you. Sam. Thanks, Denise.